Welcome to Firecat First Friday, April 1st. This is not an April Fool's uh, day for us. It is a my favorite day of every month. And today um, I'm super excited to have a wonderful conversation about design leader and ethics with you smart people and my co-host, Julie Jensen. Julie, why don't you introduce yourself briefly? Oh gosh. Uh, so I have been managing user experience teams for probably 20 plus years at companies that you would recognize USAA. I'm in San Antonio. I know there's lots of folks from USAA in San Antonio, so you'll know what that company is. But I've also been at Microsoft, Amazon, Capital One, and have um, written, written books about a feedback formula that I've created. So I um, really have settled back into San Antonio, and I'm really excited to be back and having this discussion with you, Susan, and all these folks who are going to be uh, contributing to the discussion. So, That's right. Well, since we're a small group, why don't we all introduce ourselves briefly. If you are not able to come off mute, you can uh, tell us in chat. But Bob, why don't you go next? And I'll just call on folks. Hi, sure. Hey, everyone. I'm a lead UX designer at at and And right now I work on our design system standards team. So we create a uh, design system library in, uh, in Figma, and we also support the development of uh, components that match for the technical folks. And uh, we also support a diverse or spread out UX team that uh, uh, is embedded in the business units at at and Consumer. So uh, I've been about the same doing this for a uh, little over 20 years. and. Uh, at USAA, SBC, at and and various other uh, names that uh, our company has merged and demerged into. DirecTV has been there for a while. Now it's out. So uh, yeah, uh, and then I like staying involved in uh, different organizations like TEDx San Antonio or uh, Creative Mornings or anything where I can kind of keep uh, what I like to call, and this is appropriate for this topic, kind of my my management skills, if you will, or those kinds of things, those things that you don't really do in your day-to-day -day job, uh, uh, I kind of keep those honed in by my volunteer work. So I'm excited uh, to participate today. Glad to be here. Thanks. Chris, why don't you go next? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris McDermott, aka McD. I'm also old schooler with Bob and uh, some of these other folks. I did the USAA thing, uh, helped start and build their an initial intranet and then worked on the internet site uh, both for a while there. Then went independent, been doing it ever since. Uh, I'm kind of a jack of all trades right now on the outside world, if you will. But on the inside world, I was a you know interaction designer, technical producer, if you will, kind of putting everything together. Uh, happy to be here. This is great. I'm uh, loving our first Fridays. I'm kind of wishing uh, this weather and everything we could do it in person, but this is still and the topic today is fantastic. It's very topical. Recently, uh, NPR just had a good episode about uh, what we're going to talk about today. Some really good input. So uh, I'm excited to hear it. Thank you for having me. Next. Darling, would you like to go next? Yeah, my name is uh, Darling Graciela Villana Mata, and I'm not in the field, but um, I, I just love learning and I do have a website and I'm trying to make it more sophisticated. I, my background is actually in trauma, so, uh, sociological trauma and individual trauma. So I've now been starting to get people wanting me to get more involved and they say, where's your website and all of this and it, and I've always been a, um, an aficionado of, of everything tech. Um, and as I've gotten older, my ability to retain is not that great. So I'm taking, I'll be taking a lot of notes. But I do want to share that it took me 10 minutes to try to get on. It kept saying that the host was in a different um, meeting. And I had to go through, even though I don't know if you were aware of that, that there might be people that are trying to get in that they can't because for some reason they think you're somewhere else. So Yeah, I've got a disconnect between uh, Eventbrite and Zoom that I'm going to need Chris's help to fix. But we did this last last month too, so oh, okay. I'm, I'm tired of it. Let's fix it, Chris. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'm looking forward to hearing all the uh, wonderful stories and uh, your, your knowledge. So thank you for having us. 
um, the sociology background is going to come in handy today. Yeah. Um, Ak, why don't you go next? And then Maria Jose Munguia. Oh, we're actually saying stuff here? Oh, Ak, yeah, I've just... been in a few of these here. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, that's actually an abbreviation. And you know, now, that, now the awkward is now a direction, means you're coming towards me. So <laughs> anyway, but I was working with Susan and Chris back in this large financial services company that seems to be having trouble keeping their website running these days. That was interesting a few weeks ago. Hey, we're all so. gone. What do you expect? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but computer geek, I do computer geek stuff still. And I don't know. If, and someday I'll wake up and tell you more stuff. Maria, would you like to introduce yourself? And if you can't come off mute, you can just shoot us something in the chat. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Well, I, I was just going through Eventbrite and then the, the website suggests this like webinar. So I'm really interested in what I can learn about it. And I mean, there's a reason why it appeared in my, in the website. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm Susan Price. I am the CEO of Firecat Studio. We're a um, an experienced strategy firm. We do uh, digital design and strategy for usually larger companies that have their own design team, but uh, need help figuring out what to design, how to design it. Uh, we do a lot of user research and usability activities. J Julie is helping us with a couple of, of those kinds of projects right now. And um, let's, let's go ahead and get started. I am going to share some slides that Julie and I have come up with. Are you able to see? Yes. Okay. Julie, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so this is a, this is a slide with a ton of words on it. It was until I moved off of it. And there you go. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of our, our uh, premise is that design has a seat at the table. And so I thought it might be interesting to really think about, is that really true? Does design have a seat at the table? And so all of these numbered items, one through seven, are things that I found just went out and looked at job descriptions for, for designers. Um, and maybe it was, maybe it was user, it was UX people. And I pulled a couple of comments and uh, we're highlighting a few of them where it's uh, a little bit of the green, if you can see the green, if you're not colorblind. And the first one, it's like, keep the voice of the customer at the forefront. Gosh, that sure sounds like, that word forefront sure sounds like you've got a seat at the table. Collaborating closely. Yeah, okay. That, that means that you've got a seat at the table. You're going to be working with people, right? You'll be, you'll be a part of the people that are making the decisions um, with these other disciplines. Hmm, the word confer with management. We kind of thought about the word confer. What does that, what does that mean? Does that really mean that, you've, that this position is intended to have that seat at, that, at the table? And it sounds like you're conferring with management and the development teams. But I, I would wonder what the, what the word confer means. Is that really an opportunity for them to say, thank you for your input, that you're, you're not really at the table? Uh, number four, analyzing user needs to determine technical requirements. I get a little bit mm, questionable about that. If you're really only doing design in order to determine technical requirements, does that mean that you're going to be constrained by the, by the technical elements? And then number five, you take ownership and confidently apply. Right, that is that sure feels like you're in an empowered position. What about the number six? Um, you know, always present the thinking behind your work. And and Susan and I talked a little bit about this. Does that really feel like empowered? And I I kind of question the word always. Always having to present the thinking behind your work. Does that really mean that you're going to have to justify and rationalize and defend everything that you do? Or and number seven push the team's view of what's possible. That sure feels like you're a member of that table, right? Where you have the opportunity and the authority to make decisions. All of this really is just intended to say, 
design has come a long way. Several of us on the call are, have been in this for a couple of decades. And hopefully we're all recognizing, you know what? We do have that responsibility and that opportunity to bring our voice to the table. And so what I would say is, how about you all? What do you think is in your job descriptions? Probably some of us have been, you might've been promoted. You may be at the same company, Bob. It sounds like you've been at the same place. Your position is probably changed, right? Maybe you don't even, you're, maybe you're not even working off of the job description, but what are the indicators that, that say, yeah, we, you are there, you're a respected member and you are an equal voice. Anybody wanna pop in? I'm kind of through the baton to you, Bob, but anybody can speak. Sure, I have to come up and beep first, I guess. <laughs> I, I think that um, I, I think that's definitely true. I, I found that uh, it, it's really not so much the position, because especially in enterprises, your role, if you're doing waterfall or agile type project work, um, is completely different from your job description or your job title. Uh, so it's how you do these kinds of things are, and when you collaborate, are you really reaching out to the leaders or just anyone? Um, when you analyze or do those requirements or stories or user stories for agile and, and features and epics and all those other blah, blah, blah things that, that determines exactly your, your knowledge, you know, your, the scope of your knowledge. So I think this hits a, a lot on all of, uh, of a lot of points of having a seat at the table. Um, but I think it also involves having that relationship, a personal relationship with your manager or your leader and the leaders on those other teams. How are you reaching out and communicating with them? How are you conferring with them? Uh, and that's not necessarily always up, down. It's sideways quite often that's yep. that's that's kind of my thoughts Anybody like, general stream of consciousness i'm happy to weigh in on this one um i have always had a good experience just assuming that i have authority permission you know that my my opinion matters sometimes i i have it proved to me otherwise but I've, I've gotten a lot of traction in my career of just assuming that I should just go ahead. Exactly. Not yeah. waiting for permission, not being, not waiting to be asked. Right. I think that's really interesting because I think there's a lot of other disciplines that, that don't wait to be asked. They just sort of assume it too. So mm -hmm. I feel like that. Anyway, uh, any other burning issues? All right. So are we all convinced that we do have a seat at the table and now it comes with some obligations. Susan, you want to talk about the Venn diagram? Okay, so I I love using this to talk to my you, Bob. You were talking about lateral discussions and and cooperating and conferring and collaborating with other groups. The uh, the way I have typically seen design is that I my team is responsible for representing the users. So we're in the desirability bubble. We're in the, the user needs bubble. And then the business partner, the sponsor of the projects that we do, the business units that are going to be uh, using the technology when, that we're building, they have business needs. And then the business needs have to be balanced with the user needs. And then on the bottom, the technical folks, we are going to run into some constraints or some considerations. And so they need to be part of the solution. And that if we're not working in that red zone in the middle that says innovation, where everything overlaps, then we're wasting our time. So I've used this Venn diagram for years and years and years. But when we were talking about this topic, I found an article that had a link to this one on the right that looks more like an, an atomic model. And it, it has those same desirability, feasibility, and viability, but it adds two more dimensions that have that speak to ethics. One is responsibility and one is sustainability. So in sustainability, we often do this in uh, marketing. You can, you can do a marketing campaign that is so aggressive that it makes people tired of hearing from you. So if you do that, you have violated the sustainability model 
and it will begin to impact negatively viability and desirability. So th these things I think need to be need to be considered. And then responsibility, what do you think that means? What would you assume that means in this diagram? I, I think it's, you know, you have, you have to be re responsible that in this diagram, that you're hitting those three things, that you're not just focusing on products or the services, or I'm sorry, not just products and services, but also the people. I, I love that it's planet and profits. Yeah. That it's, you know, it's kind of that holistic thing. And the, I, I've never seen planet written into a something like this where, yeah, that pretty much holds your feet to not, not putting crap out that's going to get thrown away or, you know. Right. We're going to get into some examples. Kind of We're going to get into some examples. For me, responsibility is, is, taking responsibility for the things we build. If I was a, a designer of car seats and the car seat ended up hurting children, I would need to take responsibility for that. If I design an interface or a device that makes, makes people have uh, early dowager's hump or neck issues, maybe I need to take responsibility for that, right? So I, I also think of it in terms of when we design things, we're putting them out in the world. We're, we're part of that. We're part of the, we're, we're hired by a, a company or, a, or an organization, a government, but we have responsibility that we went to work for that company. We have responsibility that we're furthering their goals. That's what it means to me. Any other thoughts before we move on? See, it's interesting that you that your definition of sustainability, we didn't have this discussion before we started. Sustainability to me is has so much more to do with the planet than it does the sustainability of the marketing campaign. So it's it's interesting to, to see the different levels mm -hmm. that each one of those atomic structures, I wish I knew my, my chemistry better to know what the, the far reaching ones would be called. Um, in terms of how many different levels there are to be responsible for uh, from the from all of those and sustainability too. Geek moment, I believe those would be the paths of the electrons that are circuit. Uh, yes. Proton and there was like, I, don't, I think the proton is the thing that's in the building. In the middle, right? <laughs> the protons. It's okay. much too big to be a proton though. <laughs> That'd be about the size of one of these tiny, it'd be smaller than the period. <laughs> Neutrinos. All right. There you go. <laughs> then, but actually the other phrase you want is outer shells. Electrons go in shells and they kind of go in layers that way. There you go. So yes, I can do on the geek stuff here. Leadership, right. nah, not so much. <laughs> I think, yeah, so I think the bottom line is that you know, over the years, design has proven our ability to persuade, influence, and drive behaviors. Uh, we can see this through um, a variety of our methods and our, our principles. And ultimately, design experience and expertise can be leveraged for the good, and it can be exploited for the bad. And we also need to be mindful that we, we have responsibility and accountability for either leveraging our expertise or exploiting it as well. We are a part of that decision-making. If we have that seat at the table, um, it's not as if it's a they versus us and they're gonna use our expertise. Sometimes we are asked and we, are, we choose to exploit that design expertise to influence and drive the wrong behavior and, and damaging behavior. We're gonna talk a lot about leveraging and exploiting and some of the things that we see um, coming. All right, but let's have rubber meat road here. What? Are there companies and industries and, that you would you'd not be willing to work for? Where's your where are your boundaries? Are you, would you be willing to work for all of these companies or any of these companies? The, right, the right bottom is 
uh, from an article about Russian oligarchs. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> We have your yachts. <laughs> <laughs> One of these is is mine. Um, Firecat is a registered vendor with the state of Texas. And so I get offers to do usability for the Texas lottery all the time. And me personally, I just don't want to do business. I don't want to put my design skills to work for the Texas right. lottery. I feel like it's it exploits poor people. Right, right. and I, I agree with that. And I, um, I know a company I used to work for that would not do anything with alcohol or tobacco or uh, gambling or anything salacious, you know, so um, any of those who came to, I had like a beer company come and try to work and he's like, no, 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 no. So, um, yeah. And I, I think, um, the 7-Eleven might be one that's like, what's, what's that? And I was really thinking about trafficking, right? There's, there's definitely companies that traffic and 7-Eleven has been accused of trafficking just for labor, right? Not the sex trafficking that is, a, you know, just a, a pain in the, in the culture today, but also um, just labor trafficking and, and forcing people to work. Hmm. Yeah. Valera hits the sustainability part of the diagram that you were talking about for me. I, I hope that Valero is working hard to pivot to be an, an energy company and not an oil and gas company, but I'm not seeing a lot of sign of that. Admittedly, it's a big, it's a big change, right? So let me, th let me throw, I, some, what bothers me is that everybody is drawing that line in the uh, and and I, I respect the I respect the decisions, but I'll take you know let's just take the the, the lottery decision or the lottery example or or any you know handful of these. Can you not work for them to do good for the design that is that helps the user who is going to be there whether you work for them or not. The lottery is going to continue. 7 is going to continue. Valero is going to sell gas till we all pass away. So can, can the work that you do inject good in some way? And can the, 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 the earnings that you get, the value that you get for that experience, doesn't have to be your life calling, but can you do good with that? Can you also interject goodness into the into those companies or their uh, uh, or or their way of thinking to say you know what about doing this with this program part of the UX just a little thing can you make a baby step there and and I I say that I say that having worked for a company in in my career like this so. Uh, you know, I guess that would be in the considered dark. But so, what what about that? I mean, is you're on you're on the end of your rope. You've got to have you've got to make a living. And Nestle, that's a nice that's a nice easy example. Nestle comes to you and says, "We want you to help us with our UX, even though we're going to make people overweight and and diabetic." So, can, isn't the, isn't there a good part of that? Is Darling it, had it raised her hand. Darling, what are you, what ahead, are you want to say? Well, from a sociological perspective, uh, the, uh, I'm reminded of C. Uh, Wright Mills. Do you work within the system or do you create a new system, an alternative system? And I think it depends on the system. Uh, you have to evaluate, is the system doing cosmetics? Uh, I don't mean makeup, but you know, a cosmetic approach appearing that they've changed. Um, or not. Uh, so one would be evaluating that particular organization that you're wondering, should I join or not? What's their history? You know, what's their, uh, uh, when I think of the stock market, you don't look at day by day fluctuations, you look at the month, the year, and many years to see where are they going? Are they doing any true, honest core changes? And if they are, are doing core changes and they need your expertise to help them, further that, then that's one thing.
But if it's a system that says, oh, yes, we're going to help out, then, but they really don't. And I'll give you a good example. Um, many eons ago, when I was a trainer on multicultural issues and um, crisis management, I was hired by um, Kaiser Permanente to figure out why um, the Asian, um, Southeast Asian population, the both people, were going more towards an um, social service agency that was all white versus another social agency that had people of color in the front and in the back and all of that. So I went and I did a needs assessment. I went to the communities to find out why are they choosing this versus that? And they said, well, they look like they look like us, but their policies aren't, aren't that way to really understand our community. But this other group that's all white, all of the dominant culture, their policies reflect what we're going through. So we go with the policies and we go with what they actually do, not what they, they do. Oh, what is a window dressing? So I think uh, it's a little bit more complex. You really have to do an assessment of wherever you're going to. And again, if you're, if you're starving and the only, the only place to go and work is Nestle, then you work with Nestle, and then later on, as you're working with Nestle, you try to build up some income or some savings and continue looking for another type of company to move to. So those are my two cents. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I put Nestle on here is that they're, uh, they take over pristine sources of water in order to do bottled water and so they're they they have a, a net negative net impact on water availability in some really key areas i actually worked for irs for uh in my college years and i i bob i think it's an interesting point you can go in there with the idea that maybe i can be some change from within you know and and if you're on that lower part of the maslow's hierarchy you, you take what you can get, right? You need to survive. You need to feed yourself and your family and whatnot. And it's a, it's a place of privilege to be able to make decisions like we're talking about, right? I, I have the, the great good fortune of being able to say no to Texas lottery myself. You know, I, I realized that that is a, a place of privilege. And maybe I could be in Texas lottery and, and help them make it, you know, per, uh, maybe recommend programs that would do a lot more good. It, it's a good question. It's not an easy, this is not an easy decision for anybody. And I've had deep discussions um, with, with Firecat team members about which companies they were willing to serve or not. We do work with the Air Force. I've had people not wanting to work with the military. I've had people not wanting to work with USAA because of their military connection. It's, you know, I try to honor that. Sometimes I find it irritating and sometimes I find it baffling and sometimes I'm saying yes, inspiring. The, the uh, uh, political parties is another one. Mm. A Ashley's uh, business, remember that story too. Um, of her having to sell to uh, uh, oh Corey you know, Ashton, someone that she Corey Ashton, yes, thank you. Yep, yeah, oh he's God, on he's on my he's on my list of of ethics. Uh, what we're talking about, there's a a competitor of Firecat, Par Giles Parscale, used to be, and uh, was run by Brad Parscale, who went to work for the Trump campaign and helped him get elected through use, very clever use of SEO, content strategy, and metrics, like e exploiting metrics, in my opinion. <laughs> but he was really good at it, so. So that's kind of a white hat, black hat situation there, mm -hmm. but from a SEO perspective. And I think that's mm -hmm. really what we're, we're pointing out here is that, you know, <laughs> I, I hear, I, I mean, I think we've all are in the situation of, all right, just being user centered, whatever means that we're here to advocate for the final, you know, the user in the end. But <clears throat> so if I'm at a company that I don't appreciate their larger 
uh, goal or whatever your mission, I guess, um, mm -hmm. I can still feel good that I'm here to try to make the situation better. And then I'm going to interject every little tiny bit of direction in the good, you know, I can. It's like, hey, I'm going to, it's like sort of, we're secret superheroes. I'm having to work here. But every little tiny thing I do has a positive angle towards the user. And I have to obfuscate that from my superiors. <laughs> so like I feel I, like I, that would be a lot of internal conflict. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm uh -huh. you know, this is I'm I'm in a I'm in a superhero movie in my head with this, but I'm mm -hmm. applying it to our, our situation. But the idea would be, okay, I am going to try to set up things to encourage users to do what's best for them in actuality not so much what's best for the company. Whereas if I'm at another company where I value their mission and I really do think they're doing the right thing, then my decision in making this whatever is going to lean maybe towards the middle. So it really does feed them both. So I think that's how maybe we can secretly or subversively, uh, um, uh, I don't know what's the word, act it, well, show how, my participation i guess I don't know. how are you building your story chris you know so like if someone is new and they say you know i've got to get started in the ux field and there's this opening at 7-eleven in design so create your start to create your story where everything that you worked on or tried to submit or design or create was you know telling the story of good versus bad light versus dark you know whatever right you want to say. good uh, you know, I, I think that's all, and that kind of goes to uh, Darling's point too. You know, uh, I think the only way I could deal with it is if I were saying I'm, I'm infiltrating for research. Infiltrating, <laughs> right? Right. I'm doing research or ignorance. You yes. know, youth, youth and ignorance. I, I had no idea this. Oh, oh uh, and goodness. I'm going to say that right now. I, I would have been like, if seven. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, if Nestle came to me, chocolate is what comes to my mind. I'm like, yes, but now that what Susan just said, maybe not. I mean, you know. Yeah. In the beginning, yay, Nestle, chocolate, love it. Yeah, I'm going to go work for them. I'm going to brag about it. And I'm going to do some great things, make some good money. And then I'm going to learn the ugly truth. And maybe I'm going to look for another job. There's <laughs> a lot of ugly truths that we are still ignorant of. And it's well, then, easy and, and, to and, throw it, stones and fall for stories that aren't the yeah. full picture. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting because I think that uh, I'm a true believer that people can change, right? And I want to believe that companies can too. I want, I want to believe that even if they've got, you know, a negative um, mission that you can bring the right information and change it. Okay. Absolutely. I think our industry has done this from the beginning. I mean, the whole concept of user centered, I mean, you, me, all, the, the USA folk here, the big house folk that are any large corporate folk back in the nineties understood that that was exactly it. It was the business being slapped in the face by us saying, hey, you can't just throw it out there and expect them to use it. You, you know, there's some goals. There's some, you know, middle ground we have to work on here. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that 100 percent. You know, they're being forced to because it's being put to their bottom dollar. It's mm -hmm. like, well, I could do this and sell more. Does that sound like a good idea? You know? Yeah. I and think this makes me think of the, the uh, lesson I learned from from Ryan Rumsey. He's, he does. He has a theory of the, the Trojan mouse. Instead of the Trojan horse coming in big through the doors, mm -hmm. you send in the mouse and get the mice in there little at a time and go from within, you know. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I think Susan has moved us on. I'm 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 suggesting we go to the next <laughs> Sorry, to the okay, next point. Good story. Good fascinating yeah. conversation yes. though. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Yeah, so if we think about, you know, the, the good, leveraging the good of things, right? We've done a lot of research in the industry around behavioral economics, and it can be used for really the good. What are the habits and the biases that people have and how do you use them for improving their health or their finances or, or what have you. But we also can be encouraged to exploit uh, some of our, um, our dark patterns. And the truth is that those companies listed previously in the industries um, are, are really asking and pushing for design to, to, to leverage those behavioral economics into dark design patterns, right? And, and get um, and exploit them. And so I think, had, are you all familiar with, um, like, are there examples of where dark patterns have maybe been used for uh, the wrong things? Have you been put in a position where you've had to fight against using dark patterns? 
the one that that typically stands out is where it's like the default is opting in opting in for something opting oh yeah in. yeah like a newsletter and things like that it's already yeah. it's already checked that's really common um yeah. I, I can I can't think of any that I've done in my work, but I know I have been uh, I've, I've fallen for it, even knowing what I do. <laughs> you know, it makes it too easy, too easy to spend the money. Doesn't give me a chance to think about stuff, and I'm like, oh, it's on the way. Dang it! Yeah. <laughs> so it just made it so so easy, and uh. And so I, I, I don't know if that's good or bad. I just feel like I didn't. I thought I was going to get another preview or a you know chance to opt in or whatever. And it's like, okay. It's, it's done. You're done. It's, it's done. done. It's, it's, done. Done. it's <laughs> on the way. <laughs> I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> another, another delivery. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's what I think about whenever I, I was like, I, and I know what they're doing. I know exactly what they're doing, but it works. So, yeah. any other examples? Well, I would use a good one as Apple giving users control over focus. They're, they've been building in lots of controls of focus. So, I can have a do not disturb, I can have a work mode and a home mode that encourages me to stop the work notifications when, when I have decided that I need to interact with my family. That's great. The user control one, I think is really, it's, it's really a powerful to overcome some of that, the dark patterns when I've had conversations with, uh, with teams about wanting to do something automatically. And and having to go back and say, well, wait a second, we agreed on this as our principle to give, to give users control and to enable them. Um, and, and that usually helps. It's like, have we, have we changed that? Have we, are we taking away user control and that, that opportunity or in order for us to get what we want? And it, it usually ends up in a, in a mm, I wouldn't say necessarily loud, but a very tense conversation, right? When, when we're incentivized to go a certain direction and, and try to influence people to do something and we're ready and willing to use those patterns to make that so much easier than having right. it. Why don't we make the, the opt-in uh, opt choice the default? Yeah. Or um, another one is uh, the driver's license. They made donating your organs as the default. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When, when the user's needs is in direct conflict with something that would obviously be revenue generating. Yes. That is a tough conversation and we don't always win them. Mm -mm. It's interesting to have the ability though, to AB test, right. And, and hopefully have, you know, downstream impact measured, right? What's the downstream impact? Do you get more returns because people are buying things that they didn't intend to buy or they're doing things that they didn't intend to buy? Um, but that's where it gets really hard because typically you're, you know, it's, it's like, I think user experience has to break down those silos and help, help the company really understand the, the end, that end-to-end -end holistic impact. Because if you don't, you're going to, you, we potentially will optimize for this that gets more products purchased but we don't understand how many are being returned and what the cost of that is as well. Or sometimes it can just be overall brand damage by attrition, right? Like you're, you're, you're making a selfish choice and you're turning your brand into a more selfish brand. Yeah. So over time that gets to the sustainability part of that diagram that I really like. You might short-term make gains, but longer term, you're turning your company into something that the employees don't like as well, the customers don't like as well. Yeah, yeah. Next, next month, I'm having Fran Stevenson come talk about crisis communications. So she'll have some examples of that, I feel sure. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about this. So a little bit, you know, you can think about, hey, how do we make users' tasks more efficient so that they don't have to do the work, right? How can we actually 
eliminate um, the number of fields that they have to answer in order to just make it a faster, more efficient process. But at the same time, if humans aren't going to pay attention and they become just habitual, how often have you, for example, um, just accepted those you know, user agreements, right? Every time something is popping up for cookies, how many times do you just, yes, 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 I accept the cookies. And you don't, mm -hmm. you don't really know what is it that you've signed up for? What is the, what, what have you accomplished? What have you actually given away to the company? Darling, what were you gonna say? Well, I, I was thinking um, how we deal with conflict. Some people do um, prevention, other people do intervention, and other people wait until the crisis is at their door or actually inside their home. And this is almost the inverse of this. Um, how, you know, how much does it affect us personally versus how much it's affecting other people? So I'm thinking of users saying, okay, um, you know, I buy products from this company and I hear that the company is, you know, sort of bad, but I really like the products that they sell. So you, you buy the products and then you hear more about the organization and now it's starting to get into areas that, mm, yeah, I don't really like that, but I really like my chunkies and it's now being sold by a particular company. So I'm gonna ignore it because my taste buds love chunkies. I speak from experience. So <laughs> <laughs> then I hear from, uh, let's say, uh, someone else that absolutely won't buy anything from the organization. And that person gives me even more information and I go, oh my God, I didn't realize they did that too. And I look at the chunkies and I go, well, I'll switch to Snickers then. <laughs> and, I go, and I let go. And the company never knows that they lost someone. Uh, because, uh, you know, you don't contact them like, I'm, I'm not going to buy your candy bar. I'm not going to buy this. You just quietly leave. I mean, pretty soon, as you said, the brand starts to, to take a hit. And the people on top, unless they have ears to the ground, meaning that they're getting feedback from the people out in the field, they'll never know that their um, that their um, uh, ways of doing things are ultimately in the long distance in the long run going to be impacting them in an adverse way. That's such an important point. And it's one of the most important things that designers can do is design in feedback loops Yes. in everything we touch so that the, the company is truly in dialogue with the people they're serving. Because yeah. you can only ignore that for so long. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I think that there's a there's a there's a tension between short term gain and long term, and so you know the, the the negative impact on a brand is always seen as this negative thing. And what are the what are the indicators? How do you how, what's the evidence that that's actually happening? And I agree, Susan. It's like it's really hard to collect that evidence that there's a neg negative on the brand if you don't have those feedback channels in place mm -hmm. to make it happen. It all, yeah. you really have to be figuring out how to be able to collect that information so that it can inform those kind of more, so, the things that feel more subjective that are so much the gut of design. Mm -hmm. Now, may I ask you how, what, is there a manner that the design, I'm, I'm thinking of the Ukraine right now and, uh, and gasoline and oil prices versus alternative energy. And because of what Russia is doing, people are, you know, the, it's being increased. It's getting more expensive to buy gas. The oil companies are taking advantage of that. Uh, I think the president pointed that out, um, that they're taking advantage. And so they're moving away, some of them, not all of them, are moving away from the road they initially promised to do, and that's alternative energy for the long term, which will benefit everyone because ultimately uh, energy companies will start adapting more and more alternative ways of, of making their money through wind, solar, and batteries or anything else that they discover. 
how does design help the user and the company uh, invest in the long term? Because the people are, you know, saying short term, they're not thinking this way, it's short term. All they're thinking is, oh gosh, it's $7 a, a gallon in LA. Um, and uh, the, we want more oil. But they don't realize that uh, it's impacting them in an adverse way in the long term if they don't start investing more and more in the uh, alternative fields. Well, where, would, where would design come into this? Or would it? at all. I, I want to say in the situation you're talking about communications and content can help with that and strategy can help with that of just making people aware, you know, but it's hard. It's <laughs> the, the, the exact situation that you're describing the like, I, I want us to help Ukraine more. Why aren't we helping Ukraine more? <laughs> it's like, but if you're not willing to pay, you know, another dollar in gas, then they they want somebody else to do the helping. Mm -hmm. They don't think of it as a we. They think those people should help. Those those people in the Defense Department, those people in Poland, those people in France and Germany, rather than I can help, <laughs> right? Yeah. Jared Spool. Sherry, you have a hand up? Oh, Sorry, Bob. Oh, no, go ahead. Go Sherry, ahead, what were you going to say? Or, yeah, I was, I've was. i got a few minutes. i got to drop for another meeting, oh, yeah. but I wanted to bring up the fact that um, I've had the opportunity to watch um, uh, partners in the store at HEB and research and see how they're using specific software. And there's some certain things we were talking about, you know, efficiencies for performance versus human frailties, because um, they have things that go, just an example of last week, uh, I was helping uh, or just observing someone track down why the store got 30 cases of hummus. And um, they couldn't figure out why, and they just needed 30 containers of hummus, not 30 cases. Wow. So he brought up the screen that they do the ordering from. The unit of measurement was on there but whenever they put in 30, it did not convert or show. And he said, sometimes it does come up and say, that's more than usual or whatever. And they just click through it because they're in such a time crunch. And I, he said, it's their fault. I said, no, it's not. That one little stop is not enough for them to stop and realize what they're doing. So it's not their fault. We've got to design something else that will stop them. So that's the thing is they're like, oh, the users are just used to that. And they just, you know, click through. So they ended up with 30 cases of hummus <laughs> because of a system error. And it turns out that they were switching that source from one warehouse to the other. And that source had a unit uh, max on it. So you're not supposed to order more than 10 cases. So how in the world did you get 30? Because they moved the source from one warehouse to the other and in the transfer they didn't catch the max amount. So just tra tracking that stuff down, we've got, we've got to prevent those types of errors. And, um, and that obviously what was in there is not working. So, <laughs> but just want to give you that example of, um, of how we can leverage those. Um, but I'm going to run to my other meeting. Thanks so much, this is great information. Thanks, Good to Sherry. see you all. Good to hear from you, Sherry. It's so tempting for, it, especially in complex apps like uh, ordering, you know, food and stuff for H -E, up front H E B, um, to rely on things like training. I know that those of us who've been in the design game for a while, you'll you'll argue that something is too complex, and they, well, we'll train to it. And on an internal app, you maybe have that to fall back on, but in in practice, it's it's not the best solution. And it's still costly. I mean, yeah. it's still it's still cost it's still cost you. Yeah. I really am and so intrigued by the question about Ukraine. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm not trying. It's I'm jumping to a design solution, but can you imagine a situation where you're pumping gas and 
um, you get messages, right? Like Susan said, I think content and communications might be helpful. Um, are you willing to pay, you know, uh, if you're pumping gas, the reason that this is so expensive is because of Ukraine and, and maybe being able to show you what your carbon footprint uh, of the future is based upon the gas that you're buying, right? Like how do we help inform people at the point of sale? when they are making the decision to, to buy gas. They're complaining about how much it costs, but do they understand the actual impact of that particular item? Did you all hear the story of the teacher that got their, her students to help uh, some of the Ukrainian, Ukrainian people um, uh, uh, evacuate and find the, the easiest roads or paths out of Ukraine? And it was a, it was just a fascinating story. She just brought it to her, and it was because I think she had a connection of a friend or a family member, and said they're they're contacting either me or someone else and saying how do I leave? How do I get out here? Do you are you all familiar? Did you hear that? I I hadn't heard about it, but that's that's a, a great way of applying UX. A good example, a great example of applying UX principles to a real world crisis like that, and it worked. I would love for you to share that link with us. Uh, I'll, I'll try to find it, yeah. The only other thing I would answer Darling's question is maybe, um, and it's along the lines of communication, is creating that experience vision where Jared Spool talks about, you can't really create this vision of your nirvana, what you would love everything to be. You know, if we could only be, uh, not you know not relying on on uh, natural gas, but but uh, uh, electricity instead. It, it's too hard for company leaders to to make that leap. But if you can create a vision that's about eighteen months to two years out, that's real for them. They can say, okay, yeah, I could see how we could get there. And and it has to be based on research. It has to be based on on solid design principles. But that's one way that came to mind that I think is, is useful and a way that UX can help solve that kind of complicated problem. And it goes back to, hey, you can't solve the whole thing. You can't turn a dark to good or a dark to light immediately, but you can interject some, some form of, of goodness into a situation. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Susan, I think we should talk about the next one. All right. And I think, oh no, the next one after that. I want to talk about the AI one. Oh, what happened to it? Did you already skip it? There it is. Yeah. Sorry. My magic mouse. I'm not, I'm not doing well with it today. <laughs> I'll let you lead that one. All right. So um, I did a stint at a data science startup and I learned a bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning and um, I, some of you have already heard me with this favorite hobby horse of mine I want there to be I want to use artificial intelligence to build a layer around myself a filter layer that brokers what comes into my attention and what data goes out about what I, my activities and I think that AI has a lot of potential to, to do that, but AI will only enforce algorithms, make decisions with criteria that human beings program in, right? So it, especially in machine learning, machine learning is uh, where it, the computers, because of their capacity, can process massive amounts of data and find patterns that are too, that it's too overwhelming for a human brain to find. But in order to train a model, you have to give it a set of data. And data is gathered by existing systems that were designed by humans, and they have inherent bias. Every data set has inherent bias. So this idea that artificial intelligence can somehow magically make things fair is not right. And we have to be very much on guard against this. 
Have you heard mm -hmm. about the the Google Images had a Google Image search and it, it would s serve up images that were similar to the image that you an image that you had and because the uh, training data was created by a set of programmers and product people at Google, there was a case where a young woman t tweeted to the product team at Google and said, hey, Google, I'm not a gorilla and neither are my friends. And she was an African-American dark-skinned person and Google Images was tagging her and her friends as gorillas instead of human beings. And it's because there was no diversity in the product group with their training data. So it, Google was horrified. The developers were horrified. They apologized. You know, that's the best you can do in that situation. But it's just so easy for this to go wrong. But I think it has an amazing potential for it to go right and help us. And that the uh, focus app for the Apple ecosystem is a good example of that. It can learn what I typically do in a day and suggest, hey, do you want to keep turning off your phone at 8.30? Yes, I do. Thanks. So I think it, it behooves us to learn about artificial intelligence and machine learning and Web3 because this stuff is going to fundamentally change. It, it already is changing how we operate. So the more we can learn about it, the more we can help guide and bring our you know, good intentions to try to guide it to a place that serves most people rather than exploits most people. Rant over. <laughs> what do you guys think about this? So, well, the AI stuff still seems to be happening. I just recently ran across one with COVID stuff here where they ran their test data and it was supposed to be running x-rays to try and find people with uh, lung issues. And what they ended up doing was actually giving them test data that had all kids had non-lung issues. And the, so the AI was really good at identifying kids. And everybody knows this and everybody doesn't. One of the challenges you really ran into here is they did, they published a study, put it on out there, didn't realize that was what was happening until later because that's your biggest challenge you're gonna have is your AI still needs a human to go back and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. And we haven't found a way around that too much here. So I think for your app, it'll happen because you're actually doing that. You can say, yeah, this makes sense to me. And if you're saying, oh, hey, do you wanna wake up at 2 a.m.? Well, for me, that would probably work, but for you, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that, thing, so. that gets back to our earlier point about the feedback loops. Mm -hmm. Any of these have to have a validation phase in them. And it get, Julie, you talked about that one of the best practices in a heuristic is give the user control. The, the power needs to be with an individual. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's interesting to me because there was a time in which, you know, people were intimidated by computers and by technology, right? 20, 20 years ago. It's become such a, an intimate thing, right? Like they, they, there's been studies done that people would um, it, it's more important to them to sleep with their, their phones than their significant others, right? Like if they, if they, if they had an option and they had to do away with one or the other, they'd actually would rather do away with their partner than their, their phone. Their technology has become such a integrated personal thing. And I think what we have to recognize is that, that also means that people are much more open to giving that feedback to, um, participating in that research and they want things to work more effectively and we have to enable the ability to for people to provide that feedback and to provide those those indicators and that signal of something that's working or it's not right there's there's so much more participation and just more expectation of what the technology is going to do and we can't just assume that it's technology is going to be is going to be good because it's you know it's it's not it'll there is a study of an ai um, I can't remember, it was, I think it was a Microsoft tool. I think his name was Toby, but it was all contributed to by people. And all of a sudden, Toby was answering questions. It was like a chatbot, was answering questions and using just the most foul language because that was what was being fed into him. It was like people were using that language and it was reflecting that language back out because it's just, 
it's garbage in, garbage out, right? And it's the same thing with all of our machine learning. It's if the training set is garbage or has defects, it's going to have- Or even just biases because it was a, a study of how, how society is now or how transactions are now or how power is now or how, you know, communication patterns are now. It's going to yeah. perpetuate whatever it was trained on. It's going to yeah. amplify whatever it was trained on. That that's kind of happening with our news, right? Oh yeah. Because you know we're we're optimizing on the wrong KPIs. Mm -hmm. We're optimizing on shares or responses or comments or likes. You know. Yeah. And that's not going to build the society I want to live in. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me because it's like, it's like every once in a while I have to go and buy a paper, an actual paper, um, newspaper, because I feel like it's less biased. It doesn't know anything about me. It doesn't know who's actually buying that thing. Right. It's not going to try to give me echo back to me what it is. I it thinks I want to hear. Right. And it's, it's interesting. It's like, Oh, this, this, this feels different than if I were reading that same news online. Wait, are we seeing a resurgence of dumb devices? I think we're. <laughs> is it I think gonna, you're, is it gonna think you're on to something. Is there going to be a, a retread? <laughs> Darling, what did you want to add? Power. Uh, you said someone said something about power. And I'm thinking when people are stressed out, when users are stressed out, they want to turn over their power to someone that they perceive as uh, a friend of theirs. And that has the ability to do something about whatever it is that you're stressed out about. That's how dictators and authoritarian and totalitarian governments get developed. We turn over our power because we feel that we don't have the power to change that. The media um, feeds you the same stressful information. There's no good news anymore. New news always equals bad news. Good news equals what's that? That's love feature thing that they give you for one minute for one hour's worth of bad news so the ai i am thinking is you're right the ai you know garbage in garbage out what do we do when we're living in a situation that uh, we have users that don't feel that they have the power at certain levels to um, impact their own lives so they much rather rely on the unknown source and keep that um, cell phone next to them and kick out their, their partners off from the bed because they're safe with their partners. They know with the partner, it's not going to go away. She or, she or he or they or will stay there and love them. And that's great, but that does not make their whole world safe. So their insecurities and fears turn them over to possibility of being uh, uh, misused and you know they being misused and they becoming now the product which is of course what's happened in Facebook and other places so that's my two cents yeah it's it's fascinating because I think you know I think about you know artificial intelligence and that's not it's like we think about that as oh, this is this is on trend this is something that's happening now and it's like no the things that are happening now I mean uh, the metaverse and all of this you know it's like what's what's the next thing and it has it who's monitoring that and who's ensuring that we're not replicating the same, the same pains in those new technologies? Are we relying upon the technology groups to do that? Or is it actually really the community and what's the voice that we can have there? Oops. Well, I I'm all of my news, it's a very scary thing. So I have to get out and get some good news. <laughs> um, we're over time guys. Um, any any final thoughts? Uh, the only thing I'm thinking right now is there's still just six of us left here. And so, yeah, we're gonna have to do something about the barrier. I'm guessing one of the, just the feedback that we're, we're kind of running into now is the people that couldn't get into this meeting weren't able to provide the feedback to us that they weren't able to get in this meeting. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. We're, we're gonna fix this. I'm gonna oh, it's a challenge. Yeah, one of the ones is there, by the way, is Eventbrite yeah. after at noon, wouldn't let me go yeah. back in and sign up for the meeting. Because yeah, Event, Eventbrite's just, 
not yeah. annoying. Yeah, <laughs> right. We're gonna, I'm going to fix it. It's got my attention oh, now. So oh, no, not a problem. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, yeah, it, Thanks for the fun. feedback, though. That's good to hear. <laughs> but otherwise, this topic's been really good. I mean, this has been something that just the fact that it's being, I, like I said earlier, I, there was a, and I wish I had a better reference to, to uh, an NPR article. If anybody has a podcast, you probably heard it uh, within the last two weeks where they really do talk about the ethics and in, in in doing what we do digitally and stuff. So this was this has been a really good conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure we'll have more like it because it's it's so important. So yeah, we need to continually remind this is a an evergreen topic for sure. Yeah. Well thanks for coming. And Thank thanks Julie for helping me I was say, we, for we actually we actually were gonna end on a high note because we had some ideas of there's hope and there's like things that we can do. So it's not I don't want everyone to go away and go, oh, it's hopeless, right? I think there are some things that are happening. We don't you know I, Susan's like gonna try to pull that slide. I'll up. pull it up. I'll pull it up. No, I think you're right. Actually, I was gonna say that without I didn't want to sound cheesy, but yeah, we're all here to do the right thing, continue to do the best we can for the users and the bigger ethical picture as best we can. Yeah, you know we're we're champions of that. I think by nature, uh, the UX folk, you know. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the really hopeful thing too. Is that yeah. y'all remember the Clue Train manifesto? Please remind me. It um, it, it basically putting companies on notice that consumers had power. Mm. Uh, but it was almost like a, a user's bill of rights. I think we need something like that again yes so i've been talking about this human api thing i had in my mind i need to uh just start putting some thoughts together and start a start a movement <laughs> let's make the world better but also just it. the open source communities i think give me hope the fact that you know we're we're building web3 on the blockchain with the traceability and uh, nobody's in charge uh, no government, no company owns it, and we own our own content. Um, I've been watching, I don't know if you guys indulge in a lot of YouTube viewing, but I certainly do. And one of the things that it's serving up to me right now with its uh, algorithms is people who scam scammers. Mm, yeah. That's a, this is kind of fun. Great rabbit hole. Yeah. The guy with the glitter bombs and the way he's jumped him up he's got like version four now if you're not into that guy that's that's a, a, a porch pirate uh, revenge one uh, just look up porch pirate glitter bombs and this guy he's got he puts cameras in him he puts fart sprays glitter that goes everywhere and and has it all set up in a way that he gets the video and the audio it's hilarious okay yeah uh, yeah <laughs> time minute for the when you have some time yeah Anyway, next month is going to be Fran Stevenson, his uh, very seasoned and knowledgeable uh, public relations expert, talking to us about having a crisis communications plan. And thank you for joining us, and we will see you next month. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Bye.